I can go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ophira Serrano. I represent Quest Medical. I would like to introduce to you today Adam Cook, our speaker. He's the chief at Wellstar in Atlanta, Georgia. Please enjoy our sponsored lunch and Bloody Mary in the back. There's no line right now. Help me welcome Adam Cook. All right, how's everybody doing? Thanks for joining me for this uh, lunch and learn, if you will. Um, hope everybody got a Bloody Mary. Um, Listen to the last talk. It was a World War II talk. It was awesome. Uh, touches my heart. My grandfather was in the 101st Airborne, and um, that was a great job by Sherry. So we're gonna we're gonna shift gears here and go to a more clinical side of things. And I'm here today to talk to you about the Quest MPS and the KBC method, which is the method we use to uh, run cardioplegia for all cases at our hospital. So <clears throat> just for disclosures, I am here on behalf of Quest Medical because we use their machine and we like it a lot. Um, a little background about our hospital and our system. Uh, Wellstar is a regional medical center in Marietta, Georgia. And thank you. And we have 11 hospitals that the system owns, but Wellstar is the only one that does, does hearts, so we get a lot of hearts from our feeder hospitals. Our chief of surgery likes to say that every patient that we get is a VIP, and we kind of use that mentality to, to dose our pledge, you know, personalized to every patient. Um, some of you may know Candace. She was the former chief before me. She's still at my hospital, but she got promoted, and I became the chief of the department back in November. So this is kind of her cardioplegia baby that she created um, seven years ago, and we've all been using it in clinical practice since. Um, so we have 10 full-time CCPs. We do about 1,300 hearts, at least last year. Three CT surgeons. We got three and a half ORs. One of them's a hybrid room, and as y'all probably know, the cath lab likes to hog those rooms, and we don't really get them that much. Um, and then we do about 25 to 30 LVADs and 100 ECMOs a year, and we're getting busier on the ECMO retrieval side of things, so we're really growing. Uh, when I started in 2014, we had four people, and now we have 10, and we're probably looking to hire soon. So um, so the topics of discussion for today, I'm going to give a short background on KBC, um, what it is, and then we'll go into the method and the dosing protocol that we use at the hospital. And then lastly, we'll touch on probably the most important part, which is the surgical team communication, because um, that's really what helps, uh, helps this work. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Del Nido. Um, it was developed as a pediatric solution. It's uh, typically given in one part blood and four parts crystalloid. It has high potassium, sodium bicarb as a buffer. The lidocaine provides sustained arrest, and the mag sulfate is a natural calcium channel blocker to keep the, keep the heart from wanting to contract while it's arrested. And then also there's mannitol uh, that acts as a free radical scavenger and pre prevents edema in the heart. So the KBC solution, we took a little bit away from the Del Nido and... Um, and went from there. So it's all blood. We don't use any crystalloid. Um, it's a high potassium solution. And then the other solution is lidocaine, mag sulfate, and mannitol. Uh, we don't use any buffer. We don't use bicarb in ours. We find that blood is a nice natural buffer. And all of those ingredients, none of them are super acidic anyway. So you don't really need a huge buffer. Uh, you can add bicarb if you want, but that's just kind of a preference. Um, so it provides a long sustained arrest and it uses nothing but the patient's own blood. So we find this beneficial in a few ways. Um, there's already a large burden for volume shifts on bypass, as you know. Pro uh, average priming volume is probably at least a liter for most centers, probably more. So you're giving that patient a liter when you go on pump and then you give them the Del Nido and you're giving them another liter immediately. So that's two liters of volume shifts. You all know you can hemoconcentrate it off. It's not hard. It's actually really easy. Um, but why give the volume in the first place if you don't have to? That's our philosophy. Um, it just, you know, you're trying to create controlled shock for the patient and make minimal changes throughout the procedure. That's the entire goal. Uh, so the less volume you give, the, the less of a physiologic change you're giving to the patient. Um, and it just, again, it avoids myocardial edema. And you can see here with this slide that 
was provided by Quest that the interstitial edema in the myocardial cells can, you know, it gets rid of that nice striated form that they're supposed to have. And it decreases the contractility when the clamp comes off and the heart's trying to beat on its own again. So this is the um, syringe we use. Our pharmacy prepares our additive syringe in-house and they have a seven day expiration. You can see the ingredients and percentages on there. Um, and it comes out to about 53 mils. And the only time that that changes is if the, sometimes they're out of 20% mannitol and we have to substitute for 25, in which case it's 47 mils. But either way, it's a very small package. And we, as we know, good things come in small packages. So it's great to just be able to give the patient around 50 cc's of volume um, and see a nice, easy, sustained arrest. Um, and we feel that the easiest way to accomplish this Maybe the only way to accomplish microplege is through the MPS. Um, we've been using this since the start of the program, since before I got to Kennestone. Um, so it's been almost 10 years. We're really looking forward to getting the MPS3, which you can see over in the exhibitor's hall at any time. It has even more bells and whistles than the MPS2. Um, and it goes really well with like electronic charting and stuff like that. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but yeah, we customize everything we do in the OR, so why would we not customize our cardioplegia? That's the way we look at it. Um, and yeah, if you get a chance to use the MPS3 over there and put your hands on it, I view it, view the MPS2 and 3, I compare it as you know an old car versus a new car. The 1998 car will get you from A to B. It's a great ride, it does the job, uh, but the 2015 car that has all the features and the bells and whistles is a lot safer, it's a lot easier to use, and it's gonna make your trip a lot better. Same thing with a bypass run. The NPS is going to make your pump run a lot easier and more simple. It doesn't take all. It doesn't take a double roller pump setup or any of that stuff. It's just uh, it's pretty easy. So this is how we set up the NPS for any of y'all who have never used it or not familiar. Um, there's an additive pouch on the left. Um, we put that syringe that you saw earlier in that, and the potassium pouch on the right. We just use uh, regular two milliequivalents per mil potassium chloride. So we've got kind of the formula. Let's talk about the methodology and how we actually use it. So to talk about some comparisons, again, a little bit for Del Nino's pediatric heart, one to four ratio and single dose, KBC is similar, but also a good bit different. Um, it's all blood. We use the induction dose and then we use a dosing assessment which is probably the most important part of this uh, protocol and what makes it actually work is the collaboration with the team, the surgical team during the dosing assessment period. And then finally, we use a reanimation dose of warm blood at the end of the procedure. So it combines other aspects of cardioplegia and it's also a rest dose is enough in most cases, especially if you have short cross clamp times. Um, and it's a nice sustained arrest. I don't like to refer to it as one shot because it's not one shot for everybody. Um, all patients are different. The patient's the ultimate variable, as we all know. Um, but in most cases, the arrest dose is enough, and then you reassess it half an hour. Um, and if you're good, just getting used to it, you can reassess every 10 minutes if you want, whatever your surgeon, uh, whatever makes them comfortable. So for our induction dose, um, we do a weight-based dose. It's 15 mils per kilo, and that's off adjusted body weight. Adjusted body weight is, um, it's not your actual body weight and it's also not your ideal. Ideal is a little bit too stingy. Um, so we go kind of in the middle, um, adjust it's kind of in the middle of ideal and actual. And then regardless of your size, you're gonna get a minimum of a liter and a maximum of 1500. So, uh, you know, a little old lady's still gonna get a liter even if she weighs 55 kilos. And if you get that 150 kilo patient who's huge and you're thinking about upsizing your oxy and all that, they're still gonna get 1500. Um, we stop it there. It's delivered cold with the arrest setting of 21 and the additive setting of 18 or 21, depending on your strength of mannitol. So for our cases, we use this um, Excel spreadsheet. It really helps the team be on the same page with a lot of stuff. Um, and you enter the patient's info into it. It spits out the BSA. It tells you, you know, what your DO2 on pump is according to your hemoglobin and PO2. It gives you adjusted body weight, BMI, ideal BSA, heparin and protamine doses if needed. If your uh, HMS or whatever you use isn't giving you that, 
or you say it fails or something, you can use this as a guide, even though most good perfusionists should be able to spit out a protamine dose with head math. Um, this is a nice, good skeleton. There's also another thing that has ECMO cannulation sizes and everything. It's just a really good standard uh, calculation sheet. And you can see at the top right is the cardioplegia dose, and it's 1,230 for this particular patient. Um, but again, it's not rocket science. It's their weight times 15. So you don't need the sheet. It's just helpful. Um, so this is the amount of drug that's delivered in one liter of this cardioplegia, and it comes down to 2.5 grams of mannitol, uh, 1.6 grams of mag sulfate, 100 of milligrams of lidocaine, and 21 milliequivalents of KCL. Um, and that's just with the initial liter. So if you give more than, if you give 1,500, you're going to give a little bit more than this, but you know, 1.5 times this. Um, in general, none of this is a huge concern. Um, if you do give enough pleads, you have to start worrying about lidocaine toxicity. But that, in the, according to the literature, that starts around 800 milligrams. So you would literally have to give eight liters of this pleat. So that's, uh, I've never given that much on any case. I've never even come close. Um, so that's what you get with a liter. And then the next thing that we go to is the dosing assessment. And we usually do that about 30 minutes into the cross clamp period. So the dosing assessment is our guide. Um, and we always want to know how much longer. So we do an assessment about every half hour. Do we want to redose or do we want to just go ahead and fully rewarm, warm, rewarm the cardioplegia and get ready for our warm shot? So we, we take a couple things into consideration. Number one is the potassium level. What is it if it's, you know, five and a half? Uh, or let's say you are starting to warm and you know it's probably going to go up from there. You can shut your K to zero and still give some um, additive with your redose if your surgeon chooses to redose. Um, remaining arrest time, how much longer is left in the procedure. You should probably know that as a perfusionist, but surgeons love to keep secrets. So um, you can just ask them how much time is left. Um, and then has there been any, any activity up to this point in the procedure? Or is there a reason to redose um, based off the EKG? Um, so we take all these things into account. And then just to put it in sort of a flow diagram, um, you know, you can see at the top left there, we give the induction dose and if it's inadequate or premature activity, we evaluate the delivery method, and then we redose at the surgeon's discretion. Um, the only thing that's kind of not accurate here is a 60-minute assessment. We usually do it at half an hour, um, but the 60-minute is a requirement. You have to do it at an hour, but most of us, the surgeons want to know every half an hour. Um, so these are the rhythms we never want to see when the clamp comes off, right? The VTAC and VFib, um, and your, your uh, surgeon's saying, Drop amio, drop lido, drop all, uh, mag, drop it all. Let's just, you know, shock the heart and get them out of this. But there's a better way, at least sometimes, to avoid these rhythms. Sometimes they're going to happen no matter what. But we like to give the warm dose um, to help this. And I'm pretty sure that's a pretty universal um, principle with cardioplegia now. Most people give either warm blood until the heart starts beating or some, some form thereof of a warm shot before they reanimate. Um, it, it washes out everything that's still in the heart and it, you know, gets it more normothermic and ready to uh, receive the systemic blood that's at 36 degrees. So depending on the cross clamp period, um, we set our additive accordingly. If it has been a long time since we've given any pledge, we'll give the 21 additive and the warm. If it's been uh, less than 30 minutes, we'll give the zero. But 99 times out of 100, it's right in the middle. We give the additive at 10%. And um, it helps in a couple ways. The mannitol, again, is a free radical scavenger for when the clamp comes off. Um, the mag sulfate and the lidocaine both help with ventricular arrhythmias um, that were, then they're given in the warm dose in the root. And we usually give about 400 mils through our MPS. Those are just the times that I was mentioning. Um, so the biggest thing in here is communication is crucial. I know that there's been polls of people who are afraid to speak up to their surgeons and Clinical mistakes happen because of that or whatever, but you just got to get out of your comfort zone and communicate with your team. And if they don't want to communicate with you, that's on them. Just keep communicating and doing your job. But this doesn't work as well without communication. So I put a couple of my favorite movie communication quotes on here just to drive that point home. But seriously, if you involve anesthesia and the surgeon, it works a whole lot better. Um, and you're all on the same page and you don't end up saying, well, why are you giving warm? I'm not ready. I got an hour left in the procedure. Well, if you would have communicated, you would have figured that out. So um, here's our perfusionist here using his clinical discretion and communicating with his surgeon. Um, again, we provide 
a little a lot of information is there any when we're deciding whether or not to redose is there any ekg activity what's the patient's k level what's the time since the last dose um, and then according to all that we can kind of dial in our additive and potassium settings where we want them um, and then where are we in the procedure? Like I mentioned earlier, uh, if, if you're already about to start rewarming, you probably don't need to redose um, at all. So, and then on the same page, it's on the surgeon to let you know. You, at our uh, facility, we have these little overhead cameras that are awesome, and they take the guesswork out of what's going on at the field because you can see it. But I know a lot of uh, facilities don't have that luxury, and all you see is the back of the surgeon's head, and you might see his elbows come to the side when he's tying or something like that, but... Um, for the most part, communication is a lot harder um, without a direct camera on the heart. So um, it's on them, too, to communicate with you and let, let them know, let you know where they are at in the procedure so you can, you know, react accordingly. So we kind of refer to this as comfort dosing because a lot of surgeons um, are not used to not giving cardioplegia every couple minutes. When I started at Emory, there was a surgeon that wanted to do retrograde every two minutes, and he wanted to know every two minutes it was off. So you'd say retrograde's off two minutes, and you'd hear, rrr, rrr, and you wouldn't even know what to do. And you do that 10, 15 more times throughout the procedure. So you're just guessing and playing this little game of I'm in charge, but you know, keep telling me what, keep telling me when pleage has been off. And it just takes up a lot of time. It's cumbersome. And even if you do it the traditional way, give a root shot every 20 minutes. Um, I mean, if you have the DLPY, sure, it stays connected and it's real easy and it's kind of seamless, but you're still giving pleage every 20 minutes. You're still filling up the heart every 20 minutes and changing the, the surgical field a little bit. So um, we think it really simplifies the procedure. It takes the surgeon's mind off of cardioplegia a little bit. It lets the perfusionist take over the pleage. And, you know, it has really lowered our cross clamp times a lot because we're not spending time redosing. If we do redose, uh, we don't do a lot of retrograde at our facility. Um, it's usually either a root shot or just osteal delivery. Um, so that's, but the point of co comfort dosing is most surgeons are used to giving pleage throughout their case, like, you know, clockwork, and this kind of takes that away. So in their head, they're like, shouldn't I be doing something cardioplegia wise right now? So it's hard for them to get used to. So when we started, they wouldn't even see activity, but they would give pleage just in case. Um, and then we found that it was hard to get the heart to beat again because we gave too much plebs just based off being uncomfortable. Um, so anyways, what we like about the NPS too is you can step down. So let's say you're used to Del Nido. You can put that Del Nido up and hang it and set your NPS to crystalloid or one to four, and you can run that Del Nido. And then let's say the next time you want to try, let's try half a liter instead of a liter. So hang half a liter of crystalloid, same amount of uh, additive, give that. Oh, wow, that worked just the same then take that completely away and then use a syringe. So you can baby step your way to getting to where the surgeon's comfortable. You don't have to change it overnight um, and you don't have to you know, change the way that your surgeon is used to. I mean, obviously that's his decision, but that's kind of uh, what our experience has been so far with it. And then just this is just a graph that just kind of shows the NPS3. We haven't gotten one at our facility. I, I'm excited for when we do get one, but they're you can play with the one here. Um, and I mean, you can give all blood single dose, Del Nido, um, Buckberg, Custodial, Plegisol. I mean, you can do anything with it. And then with the new one, those little pouches in the back come from pharmacy and you just click them in your machine and um, you're ready to go. So for us, we've been using it since 2016. So for seven straight years, we've used it on all of our patients. All three of our surgeons use it. Um, and like I said, we do probably close to without tavers, probably over a thousand hearts a year. Um, some of those we do warm beating. They don't arrest on a lot of our cabbages, but uh, for the most part, we give this pledge to every single patient for every single type of cardiac case. And um, we've had great results and we really like it. So that, that kind of sums up everything for the KBC, but um, I think we're gonna stick around and have plenty of questions from the audience. And, you know, we even have some some pre-made up questions, but if anybody has anything that they want to ask off the bat that's here or online, please feel free to do that now. And thank you, everyone. Very good. Thank you so much, Adam. And